So last week on this channel, I did a serious scientific dive into the first science images released by the James Webb Space Telescope, or JWST, and I chatted about what we could learn from each of those images. So with all of that serious stuff done, you can check out that video if you want to, I figured this week let's have a little bit more fun. So I asked you a lot on Twitter and Instagram to send me all of your favourite JWST memes that you've seen across the internet so that I could react. Now admittedly, I've probably seen a few of these myself already because they're all over the internet, but I got Sam to go through all your replies and pick out the best ones that I could at least attempt a blind reaction. So let's just dive in and start with the first one, which he said was sort of like loads of memes all on the same theme, which I think I can kind of guess what it's going to be about. Yeah. <laughs> Essentially just taking the piss out of all of those images that compare like the Hubble Space Telescope and what uh, JWST sees and the change in resolution. So you've got, you've got Hagrid there, that's amazing. You've got the horse said Nebula, you've got Spider-Man, you've got Oculus Reparo with the Mighty Granger, I particularly like that one. You've got the Spongebob reference and then you've got Paragon from Pokemon. I think the Spongebob reference is my favourite one, like the way to my heart is a Spongebob meme, let's be honest. Now essentially what these memes are referring to is the much bigger resolution of JWST, essentially because it has a much bigger mirror than the Hubble Space Telescope has. The Hubble Space Telescope was only 2.4 metres across and JWST had a mirror that was 6.5 metres across. So you have a much bigger area for collecting light. But also JWST sees in infrared, which allows us to see through the dust. So all the molecules of things like carbon and other heavier elements that block visible light, essentially the infrared light is a longer wavelength, so it just goes around them. In the same way that like an infrared camera reveals things that our eyes can't see. The thing is though, as you observe things at longer and longer wavelengths, like longer... The thing is though, as you observe things at longer and longer wavelengths, like infrared light being longer wavelengths than visible light, your resolution actually gets worse. And when I say resolution, I mean what's the smallest distance between two objects that you can pick out before they blur into one. And we can work that out with a fairly simple formula. It tells you the distance between two objects, but in terms of an angle, an angle because you're working with 360 degrees round on the sky. So it's essentially saying like, what angle on the sky can you make out? And the same way that you'd say maybe like the sun and the moon are 90 degrees apart from each other. And the full moon is half a degree across. It's kind of like, what's the smallest you know, fraction of the total amount of sky that you can actually make out. It's a fairly simple formula. That angle is essentially equal to 1.22 times by the wavelength you're observing in divided by the diameter of your telescope. So if you make this number bigger, then this number gets smaller, i.e. your resolution gets better because the distance between two objects in the sky that you could make them out as two objects and not one gets smaller. So you can resolve smaller and smaller things. But if you make this number bigger, i.e. you go to a bigger wavelength, i.e. from visible light to infrared light, then this number gets bigger and your resolution gets worse. So there are some wavelengths where HST and JWST have some crossover, i.e. they see at the same wavelengths. And at those wavelengths, then JWST is always going to have better resolution. It's always going to be roughly what, like 2.5-ish times better. And that's just the ratio of the diameters of their telescope, 6.5 to 2.4. But as you get the longer wavelengths of infrared light that JWST probes, then your resolution is always going to be worse than Hubble. In fact, we could actually work out at what wavelength that happens at... One minute... 12 seconds later. At 6.7 microns, anything longer than 6.7 microns, JWST is always going to have a worse resolution than Hubble. That's why if you look at some of the images that were released that come from the MIRI instrument on board JWST that are taken at longer wavelengths, those ones that show the actual glow from the dust itself rather than seeing through the dust, those images were just that little bit more pixelated essentially, just not as quite high a resolution as the ones from the NIRCAM instrument, which were um, much lower infrared wavelengths, like closer to the visible light. Looking at this though, like, I can't help but wonder if JWST is actually going to be looking at the Horsehead Nebula anytime soon, because that would be cool if it was. I haven't heard anything. The schedules are up. We could look. We could check. You know what? Let's check. Let's check. I shall use my wily ways to check. 
A few moments later. Okay, so at first when I was filming, I didn't find it, but then I went back and did a coordinate search, and it turns out there are plans to observe the Horsehead Nebula as part of this proposal on the chemistry of photo dissociation regions, or PDRs, which are essentially big clouds of gas that are being irradiated by ultraviolet light from nearby forming stars. Only thing is, these observations aren't due to take place until January 2023 at the latest, and some of them not even until September 2023. But it won't be long, I guess, until we can recreate this meme with a real JWST image. All right, nice one. <laughs> JWST as the Undertaker. <laughs> like, I feel like I've seen quite a few like this. Like I saw one of like the Eye of Sauron as well, like as if it was like, you won't escape me. <laughs> and while they're funny, I feel like we should be like really clear with like what JWST will actually be capable of and what it's going to find in terms of life and aliens because it's not going to be able to take like images of you know no matter how good the resolution is it's not going to be able to take images of aliens like going about their daily lives on a planet right like what it's going to be looking for is what's known as biosignatures in the atmospheres of planets so what we actually observe is when a planet passes in front of the star that it orbits around and we see the dip in light that's caused by that planet blocking out just a section of the star's light and we call that a transit and once we've observed that transit, we can essentially isolate a tiny bit of light from the star that passed through the planet's atmosphere. And while it did, tiny bits of it were stolen away by molecules in that planet's atmosphere. Essentially, those molecules will absorb a tiny bit of light, a very specific wavelength that is unique to that molecule. And some molecules will have you know, various different wavelengths that they will absorb that cause them to do different things, like vibrate at certain energies. And so if we take what's known as a spectrum of JWST, where we split the light through a prism to get its component wavelengths, we make a trace of how much light of each wavelength will receive, we'll see that there's been more light blocked at these wavelengths where these molecules are present. Molecules like carbon dioxide and methane and ozone and water, the kind of molecules that we associate with life here on Earth, right? Life as we know it, because there's you know, no other way that we know that life can exist, we're just working off what we know for now. So we saw this with the spectra of WASP-96b that was released that had all these water features through it, and we should hopefully see that soon in the seven planet Trappist-1 system, five of which are actually classed as being in the habitable zone around its star, like not too hot, not too cold for life to exist. JWST actually has already observed Trappist-1 over the weekend on the 17th of July, and the data is now already public. So again, I'll put a link in the video description down below if you want to try and access that data and have a play around with it. But even if we did find anything in the atmospheres of, say, the Trappist-1 system planets, or in any other planet for that mass, to say it's like the most Earth-like planet we've ever seen, like the same mass and size, and it orbits a sun-like star at roughly the same distance and takes roughly a year to go around its star, and it has the most Earth-like atmosphere with all of these biosignatures in it, we still couldn't say anything more than that. You couldn't make the leap from that to saying, yes, life is definitely present there on that planet and the aliens are roaming around it. Like, you'd have to send some sort of probe or mission to confirm that, and any planet you find could be tens to tens of thousands of light years away. It takes light 10,000 years, traveling at 300,000 kilometers a second to get from there to us. We have we can't go anywhere close to that speed, so I'm really sorry to break it to you, but we're not getting there anytime soon. At least, probably not in our lifetimes anyway. All right, on to the next one. I haven't seen this one. Jenny was too finally launched. It actually unfolded. It's about to release data. And it was really big. <laughs> I absolutely love this. I feel like so many of us were excited, but like we didn't get our hopes up because we were very aware of like the 283 points of failure or whatever it was that could have gone wrong in that whole unfold process that we had to go through. It was just that nail biting few months. And now like we're finally getting data. Like it almost doesn't feel real and just. All of this excitement and hope is just like pouring out of us. Although what I will say about this meme is that we don't actually have a deep field image yet. We don't have the same patch of sky as the very famous Hubble Ultra Deep Field image, but also the image that was released of SMACS0723 
is not classed as a deep field because it's of a galaxy cluster that's in the grand scheme of things relatively nearby the light only took four and a half billion years to reach us as opposed to you know the 13.8 billion years that we think the universe has been around for and it was chosen as one of the targets and one of the, the images to release as the first science images because it really showed off yes what the telescope could do in terms of you know detecting those very distant galaxies that are in the background but also detecting distant galaxies that have been had their light warped or bent by that galaxy cluster in the middle, what we call gravitational lensing. But it's not a true deep field like the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which was chosen because we thought it was a very dark patch of space, that there was nothing there. At least before Hubble said it for what just shy of about 2 million seconds in total, I think it's around about, you could say about 22 days total exposure time, but it actually took the telescope a couple of months, like three months or so, because you know, that patch of sky is only visible for half the time in Hubble's orbit because it's orbiting the Earth half the time. You know, the Earth blocks its view. In comparison to the SMACS image that was released from JWST, the total exposure was 12 and a half hours, so nowhere near as long. Now, actual proper deep fields are planned with JWST. And yes, in those images, we're probably going to find, like, so many of, like, the most distant galaxies ever found that are going to break loads of records, probably just, like, one tiny pixel or something. But the one I'm most excited for is the NG Deep program, which is planning to completely redo that same patch of sky as the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. But instead of like, you know, 22 days to do it, it's only going to need something like 120 hours. The number I've heard quoted is essentially 10 times longer than that SMACS image. Those observations are scheduled for Jan to Feb time of 2023, and they're going to be made public straight away. And if you're wondering, why are they waiting? Let's redo the Hubble Ultra Deep Field straight away. We have to remember that JWST also has some visibility constraints, just like Hubble, but for a different reason. Because instead of orbiting the Earth, it orbits the Sun 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth in that fixed Lagrange point two position. And we can't just, you know, turn the telescope around and point it in whatever direction because it's a very sensitive infrared detector. And the Sun is very hot and therefore a very large source of infrared light. So we have to be very careful to shield it from the sun's rays so that it stays very sensitive to infrared light from, you know, the depths of space instead. So essentially, we're just waiting for the patch of sky that the Hubble Ultra Deep Field is in to just come back around again and come back into uh, JWST's visibility range. All right, let's see what the next one is. Oh, I haven't seen this one either. This is so <laughs> cool. Like comparing the lens galaxy in the SMACS cluster to the Salvador Dali, right? Like, what is that called? The Melting Clocks Salvador Dali. Persistence of memory, that's what it's called. Fun fact, our research group actually nicknamed this galaxy the Slug, for what I hope are obvious <laughs> reasons. Essentially what you're seeing here is that the slug is in the background and then that big giant blob of a galaxy is in the... And you're not seeing the true shape of the slug, which is probably a nice spiral galaxy, but how its shape has been warped because the giant blob of a galaxy is bending space and causing light from the slug to travel a curved path, warping its shape. In the same way that mirrors in fun houses warp shapes by changing the path of light, or a stemmed wine glass warps the shape of a candle flame into those arc shapes as well. We see the same thing in space, except with massive galaxies doing the warping, and we call this gravitational lensing. And from what shape those background galaxies get stretched out to and where they end up and also how many times you see each individual galaxy too because you can actually see the same galaxy twice just in different locations if you get the alignment of these foreground and background galaxies right. Then what we do is we make a map of where all the matter is and how much matter there is there to do that amount of lensing. And we always find that, you know, it never matches up where where we see stars, gas and dust, or how much stars, gas and dust that we see there. So it's just more evidence for matter that doesn't interact with light, aka dark matter. So, I don't know, maybe we should rename our friend the slug to like, the persistence of dark matter instead. <laughs> Alright, next one. <laughs> Tornado guy. Love this. Here it comes, 20 years of new space discoveries. I mean, and the rest. Like, yes, okay, the telescope has fuel enough to allow it to continue science operations for 20 years to make it point in whatever direction of the sky that we need it to. And that was much longer than we were originally sort of thinking. We originally think it was like more like five or 10 years 
of science operations, but the launch was so precise that we didn't need to use any of that sort of spare fuel to do any course corrections, which was great. But the sheer amount of data that JWST is going to give us is going to keep us busy way longer than 20 years. Like, remember first that all the instruments on board JWST observed the sky simultaneously, like capturing slightly different patches of sky as they go. So say you put in a proposal to observe like a specific patch of sky, right, that's interesting. You. Maybe like it's like the horse head nebula or something, right? But what will happen is that you'll get data on the Horsehead Nebula from the one instrument that you wanted it from, but then you're going to get all this bonus data from other patches of sky with all of the other instruments on board that you didn't ask for, nobody asked for, in fact, and they'll probably just sit on computer archives until people have time to go through them. It's going to be absolutely insane the volume of data we end up with. And then if we also remember how sensitive this telescope is to faint objects because the telescope mirror is so large, that even when we look at targets in the Milky Way, we get so much in the background as well. <laughs> you know, we've been joking in JD T images that there's no longer any, like, empty space <laughs> in the background. Like, no longer any blank background sky. There's always something in there that you can find. That there's something new that you can even write a research paper on. So I think we're going to be kept busy for a lot longer than 20 years, just because of the sheer volume of data and the quality of data as well. There's going to be PhD students working with this data that aren't even born yet, right? So there is a long way to go. And we're still right at the beginning. All right, looks like that was the last one. So before I go, I just want to shout out Ellis Things on Twitter who made this meme after the blooper in my last video, if you saw it. This just reminds me of that meme that's like, look at this graph. <laughs> Even with the effort of painting my fingernails blue in the meme, which I massively appreciate, especially because it matches the best fit line on the graph. Seriously, when I realized on the day they released those first science images that my nail polish matched that best fit line, I was like, I've done it. I've reached peak space nerd. So proud of myself. I don't know. Maybe this meme review is actually peak space nerd. I'll let you lot decide in the comments. Before we get to the bloopers, a huge thanks to Brilliant for sponsoring this week's video. Brilliant is a great tool for learning STEM subjects interactively. Personally, I think the best way to learn is by doing, immersing yourself in a topic. Now, Brilliant have a huge range of courses across science, maths, and computer science so that you can brush up on whatever you're interested in at your own pace, either at home or on the go. Plus, if you get stuck, there's longer explanations to help you out even more. You know, one of the things I often see with science or physics students is that they've, you know, learned how to do a lot of things by rote and they've memorized a lot of facts, but they're missing that true physical insight or intuition for what's going on that's so key to becoming a scientist or a researcher in the future. Brilliant has a great course called Scientific Thinking that gets you to face that head on. It removes all of the maths and the number crunching to get you to think about problems in a different way and build on your physical intuition. So if that sounds like something you'd be up for, head to brilliant.org forward slash Dr. Becky, or you can click on the link in the video description down below and you can sign up completely for free. Plus the first 200 people that go to that link are going to get 20% off an annual premium subscription. So thank you so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. And now, roll those bloopers. It is 35 degrees Celsius today. In the UK, we don't have the infrastructure to deal with this heat. Our houses are designed to retain heat. So it is probably hotter inside than outside right now. But I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to turn off my fan. <laughs> so we can get good audio. Also, I bought one of my new JWST merch shirts, you know, that like celebrates the first five images released and it didn't get here in time for me to film this. And I'm so sad because the only other piece of JWST merch I have is this, which is like a really thick <laughs> jumper. And I was like, nope, not today. <laughs> Should have got that in a t-shirt. Nope, it's too hot. The hair needs to go up. It's, it's, just, it's just too warm. It's we're just going to have to go with it. We're just going to have to have whatever this turns out to be. <laughs> I'm getting like Cara from Cara and Nate vibes. <laughs> we used to call this pineapple head as kids. <laughs> Maybe I'll do this again. Video description down below and the first... Hello? Hello. 
time. I always fill it. Yeah. Oh, it's so hot. Put the bomb back on now. Uh, oh.